Hi, it's Christina with the Sisyphean Journal, and uh, this is kind of a combination rant from my kitchen and a reaction video. I'm going to link below to a really good Matt Walsh video where, um, unfortunately, about halfway through, as I would joke, he's confusing uh, Anthony Fauci with uh, Leanna Torres. Leanna Torres is an abortionist who, she said something that was very callous and pro-lifers entirely misunderstood what she was saying, did not stop to think it through, and now even Matt Walsh is running with this, I'm sorry, Matt, this is absurd. Stop and think a minute, okay? You're making yourself sound stupid. Um, Dr. Torres um, debunked the idea that you could well, she was debunking the idea that the fetus could scream, okay? The, the idea of the silent scream, that the baby's screaming when he or she is being dismembered alive. And she said, they can't scream because I cut the cord. And for some reason, pro-lifers forgot that vocal cords, cords, plural, plural, there's two vocal cords, Whereas the baby has one umbilical cord. And if you understood about how these later abortions are done, you would have immediately known that she was referring not to vocal cords, but the umbilical cord. And what she was saying was basically, dead babies can't scream. It was Dr. Fauci who cut the vocal cords of his victims, in his case, beagle puppies, so that they couldn't scream while their faces were being eaten by bugs. Um, you can just Google um, Anthony Fauci beagle puppies and see if you can eat for the rest of the day or sleep tonight. Evidently, it doesn't bother him in the least. So it was Anthony Fauci cutting vocal cords so the victims could not scream. Dr. Torres cuts umbilical cords so that fetuses are dead before she starts dismembering them and thus they cannot scream. Um, and if you're wondering why is she cutting fetuses umbilical cords, there's, there's three reasons for that, okay? So when you get to about 20 weeks, they really, 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 really want to make sure they are starting that abortion off with a very dead baby. There are three reasons for that. And I don't know how they weigh the pros and cons of which reason is primary for any given abortionist. There are just three reasons they would do it, and I'm sure they each in their own mind weigh why. Reason number one, the most commonly given reason for wanting to start this abortion with a dead fetus is simply ease of procedure, okay? I want you to picture taking a you go to the store, you buy a Cornish game hen, okay? So it's about the size of of a big fetus. You thaw out that Cornish game hen, you put it on the counter, hold that, hold it down with one hand, and then take, you're not going to have upstep, you're not going to have um, beers or hern forceps in your house, but just use a pair of pliers. It's going to be close enough. And grab the wing of that Cornish game hen with a pair of pliers and try to twist it off. And you're going to find that that is very difficult to do. However, if you take that Cornish game hen and you put it in the crock pot and you cook it for a while, you can just reach in with your fingers and pull the wing right off because cooking softens the connective tissue and makes it very easy to come apart. Now, to my knowledge, I'm the first one that made that comparison. I quipped that they are basically doing the crock pot baby. Dr. Leroy Carhart has picked up on this and I'll provide the link below. He describes killing the baby beforehand so that it's easier to take apart like a chicken in a crock pot. So it is a practical matter. If you kill the baby first, the tissues soften and it's much, much easier to reach in with forceps and pull arms and legs and so forth off this baby if it's nice and soft from being dead for a couple of days. Um, another reason, especially as you hit 20 weeks, you're risking the delivery of a live baby. Now, this can cause you problems because if you kill the live baby, you 
run a slight risk of getting into trouble if somebody rats you out and they do decide to prosecute you. Granted, it's a very slim chance that anybody's going to rat you out. And if somebody does rat you out, the chances are even slimmer that you're going to get prosecuted. And if you do get prosecuted, the chances are even slimmer that you're going to be convicted. But it's a big annoyance and you don't want to deal with it. On the other hand, if you don't kill the baby, you're going to get sued. So, you know, get, just avoid the whole thing. Make sure you're starting with a dead baby and there's no risk of a live baby. And the third one is a situation that uh, Douglas Carpin, the Kermit gods now, and I'll provide a link about him too, complained about, which is these later abortions, the way they're done, um, on day one, the abortionist inserts laminaria, which are little seaweed sticks, little sterile seaweed sticks. They absorb moisture, they swell up, they dilate the cervix. And depending on how big the baby is, you might have to change them out several times to get the cervix open wide enough to get the baby out. So he would insert the laminaria on day one and send the woman home or to more likely to her hotel room because there are very few doctors that are willing to kill these babies. You know, it's one thing to slurp them down a suction tube and let somebody in the POC room look at the little arms and legs. It's another thing to reach in, pull out a piece, and you've got this little dead face staring up at you. Many doctors find that way too traumatic. They can't stomach it. They do not want to see the little arms and legs, so they won't do an abortion at that point. It's got nothing to do with the law. These people just can't stomach it. Okay? Even abortionists can be squeamish about killing babies. Um... So, um, you have to travel to find somebody who's willing to do that. So, he was complaining that his patients would come in on day one. He'd put in the laminaria. The patient would go outside and talk to the pro-lifers who were hanging around outside. She would decide she wanted to have her baby. After all, the pro-lifers would take her to a doctor. Um, they would arrange for the laminaria to be removed and they would arrange for her to have medical supervision for the rest of her pregnancy because it's now been turned into a high risk pregnancy. But, you know, she gets to have her baby, which is, you know, you should have the right to choose to change your mind, right? To... Now, as a normal human being, what is your response to the idea that after she goes in, she has her counseling, she supposedly has her woman and her doctor consultation, and she goes out and talks to a total stranger for five minutes and changes her mind about this abortion. I think most people would say, I think your counseling kind of sucks. I think you need to up your game on the counseling a little. If after she's gathered up the money, come in, you've talked to her, five minutes with a stranger, she's changing her mind. That's what a normal person would think. If you have to remember, in abortion land, you're not dealing with normal people. The response of his fellow National Abortion Federation members was, you need to make them sign a contract agreeing to go through with the abortion even if they change their minds. Which is just about the most anti-choice thing you can say, but again, hypocrisy, thy name is choice. Um, there, yeah, that's what you do. You have them sign this contract. That way, then go ahead. They can change their mind. They can have their baby, but you don't have to give them their money back. So... You avoid that whole situation if the very first thing you do is make sure the baby's dead. Then she can't change her mind. She's, you know, she's committed to following through regardless of how she feels about the baby after day one of this abortion practice. So there are two ways that they achieve fetal demise, okay? The primary way that you might have heard, at, heard about if you're watching the David Delighton videos is called digging the fetus. That's when they inject digoxin, a cardiac drug, typically uh, straight into the baby's heart to kill the baby before they begin dismembering it. Um, that's the more common method. But the other is some doctors, apparently Leah Torres, prefer to dilate the cervix enough that they can get hold of the umbilical cord, cut it. Well, if you've cut the cord, the baby's going to die pretty quickly. You know, it's not getting any oxygen. It's going to die of oxygen starvation, you know, within about five or ten minutes. This, you know, the baby is a goner. And I think the primary reason for using cutting the cord is because the baby's a goner in about five minutes. Whereas sometimes with digging the baby, 
it, it can take 24 hours for the baby to die and sometimes this method fails entirely and you still wind up with a live but sometimes injured baby and oh boy then you get your ass sued so again it was dr fauci who cut beagle puppies vocal cords so that you didn't have to hear them screaming while their faces were being eaten by bugs dr when uh, dr torres cut babies umbilical cords so that they would be very quickly dead and dead babies don't scream okay simple as that get it right matt